All right. I think we'll kick it off here, Sean, because I know you've got a lot to say and, uh, you know, not too much time to say it in. So um, welcome, everyone, to Tech Canada's Deeper Insights webinar series. My name is Colton Esser, and I'm the Marketing and Research Analyst at Tech Canada. And it's my pleasure to be your host for today's session. Today, we have the privilege of being joined by Sean Stevens, the CEO of TreeFrog Inc. and a longtime member of Tech Canada. Sean is a seasoned expert in the world of web technology. His journey in this field began back in 1997. And for those of you older than me, you'll probably remember this as the era of abundant dot-coms and rapidly evolving rules. He immersed himself in the intricacies of website servers, databases, and program programming languages, gaining unparalleled expertise and shaping the technical vision of numerous web projects across various industries. Sean's clientele is incredibly diverse, including major corporations, leading educational institutions, government agencies, and e-business innovators, both nationally and internationally. Having a deep understanding of what CEOs need to learn and how to apply that knowledge to their businesses, Sean will be showcasing the remarkable capabilities of ChatGPT through live demonstrations and industry-specific examples in this webinar. So before we kick it off, just as a reminder, whether you're joining us from Zoom or via the live streams on Tech Canada's social media channels, please, please, please feel free to use the chat function throughout the webinar. Sean will be actively addressing your questions and providing real-time insights as we progress. So now, without further ado, let's extend a warm welcome to Sean. Sean, take it away. Hello, guys. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you very much, Colton. Uh, I've got you for an hour. I promise in the next hour, I'm going to put five hours of information into this next hour. And a couple of things are going to happen. One is, I am going to scare you, depending on how much you know already about ChatGPT and AI. Uh, and this is going to be a very sort of ex head explosion presentation. But that's not the purpose of the presentation. The presentation is not here. I'm not here today to scare you. I'm here to wake you up. If you're not paying attention to ChatGPT and what's happening in the AI space, then you need to be as the CEO of your organization. Now, I want to say a couple of things. Uh, Colton introduced me as an expert, but I am not an expert in ChatGPT. And so why would you invite a non-expert to talk about this? Well, the answer is this. There's no such thing as an expert in this. There can't be. It takes 10,000 hours to become an expert in something. That's five years at 40 hours a week or eight, 80 hours a week, maybe in two and a half years. And this thing has only been around for six or seven months and people have been experimenting with it. And we're still finding things out. I'm going to talk about that today. But despite the fact that I'm not an expert, and I'll, I'll validate why it is that I got invited to speak about this, this is a moment in history. It's a black swan event. It is probably, in my opinion, the biggest change in civilization, at least in our lives, maybe in our recent history, maybe since, say, fire. That's, you know, we've had electricity and the internet and some other sort of major things happen. But I think this is probably the pivotal and largest change in civilization that we have seen yet. Uh, this is the rubber hitting the road. Uh, we were promised flying cars. We did not get flying cars. We were promised AI, and we're getting AI. So I want to lead with this. Uh, not only am I not an expert in AI, I, or AI, I, I am actually a CEO. And I refer to myself, if you go to my LinkedIn, you could you know, LinkedIn me right now if you want. Uh, I call myself Rockstar CEO. You'll notice that there is a comma in between Rockstar and CEO, because I'm not particularly successful at either one of those things. I figure maybe if I mix them together, I'll feel cooler. Uh, here's the thing is, is that 20 years ago, and then read right as I started Tree Frog, I, I wanted to be a professional musician. And the business of music was you'd go out and you'd record stuff and you'd put it on a CD and then you'd sell the CD. Uh, and you know, the CDs cost about 25 cents to make, and you'd therefore the margin on it, selling them for 20 bucks was great. And I could go out and play a gig and sell 10 of them and make enough money to make my next recording and keep on going. That was the business model. That all changed in the late 90s. For those of you who were there, uh, you'll notice that there was a huge Napster came out, that streaming came out, that the world, the internet sort of changed everything. But you know what? I didn't change. I kept making CDs and making CDs because that's how I paid for it all. I would make a thousand CDs and then go out and try and schlep them at the local club. And now, fast forward 20 years, I have a room filled with CDs right beside me over here that I didn't sell because despite the fact that the world changed, I didn't embrace the change. 
I just kept on doing the same thing over and over again. And while, while Napster took all, I even wrote songs about the fact that Napster was stealing my music. And you know what? Fast forward to today, I actually had 10 million people view my music over the weekend, uh, which is kind of cool. Not a single CD got sold. Let me be the example to you of why you should embrace change while it's happening. Otherwise, you end up in the dead end job of CEO. So let me talk just quickly about why I'm the guy who was brought here to talk about AI today. I have a digital transformation agency called TreeFrog. We do classic digital marketing stuff using AI behind it. We build tools, often AI thing. And that's sort of I mean, the special thing is we help companies grow, get efficient and innovate. And the innovations often are AI. So for tech members, I have built AI systems. An example would be for a dental marketing company, we built a system where you uh, could take a picture of somebody's face uh, and we automatically check their teeth, straighten their teeth, whiten their teeth and show you what you could look like if you had a, some dentistry done. Not life changing, not civilization changing, but kind of neat, right? Uh, for somebody else, we built up uh, a, a camera where you take a picture of a foodstuffs and on the back of the food stuff, you see all the chemical ingredients and it will tell you whether you have an allergy or a, a sensitivity towards that food. And thus, you know, for instead of having to read it and understand it, it could do it for you. Not life-changing, but very neat. So not only do we build all these AI tools, we've done this for the last six, seven years using different forms of AI, we also have an accelerator. So an accelerator is a six week, the Tree Frog Accelerator, six week program. We run regional international companies through this. We've had hundreds of companies go through this, teaching people sort of tech logic, tech company stuff. And then we connect them with tech members and help them go off on their own. Uh, and at least a third of these companies are AI related. The thing is, all of these cool companies, I get to see all the cool companies in Canada going through this thing and they're all neat. There's been nothing like what's happening now. There's been nothing like this. You've probably seen this graph. This is a uh, ChatGPT, their sprint to a million users. It took Netflix three and a half years to get to a million users. It took Facebook 10 months to get 2 million users. It took ChatGPT five days, five days to get 2 million users. That's insane. In two months, they got to 100 million users. I realize Threads got to 100 million users in five days more recently in the last couple of weeks, but uh, they kind of had it going. This came out of nowhere, really. And then one of the largest the companies in the world, in the top 10 largest companies in the world, two, the last two decades, Microsoft, completely changes the direction of their organization and starts making huge bets, buys 49% of OpenAI, the company that runs ChatGPT, uh, change directions, change direction of their browser, change direction of all their products, and just puts all of their chips on this. What kind of massive company makes a giant change like that as quickly? They're, they're crushing it, by the way. I'm really impressed. So what is this GPT thing? So you've, you've probably heard the, the G, chat GPT, the name, and you're like, what a stupid name that is. Well, actually, it's, uh, it's a pretty smart name. And why I say it's a smart name is there's four pieces to it. Chat GPT, obviously. Let's take the chat off for a second. Let's talk about GPT. So GPT stands for Generative, Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. Pre-trained. I take a huge pile of information, all the content that I can, I pile it all up, and I make myself an engine. And I keep making myself better engines one at a time, one engine, second engine, third engine. Uh, and the, the, as the engines get better, what the engines do is they generate things. So let's talk about what, what we would generate. So if I say this, later on today, I'm going to pick my kids up from, y'all thought the word school. Later today, I'm going to pick my kids up from school. Technically, you said later today, I could pick, I could have thought I picked my kids up from the school bus. I could pick them up from the park. I could pick them up from the mall. But we all in our heads know that that's the next word that's supposed to come out. And so you guys would function as a generative AI machine. But here's the thing. We think of it as generating words. It's not generating words. And this is where the big, the big thing that happened a few years ago was the idea of a transformer. A transformer takes the concept, goes to that big giant pile and looks for concepts. And the concept, for example, you use the word pot. Well, I could be cooking with a pot, I could be smoking pot, or I could be putting a pot light in. Those are all three completely different concepts that use the same word. So I've got to go through that pile of concepts, figure out what the pile of concepts is and generate 
one in front of the other. So what that machine does is when I ask it a question, it puts a word out. And then based on that word that it just put out, it puts the next word out and puts the next word out, and puts the next word out until it runs out of memory. That's what a GPT engine does. And the genius of OpenAI, which sort of made it easy for everybody to understand, was, you know, if you had an engine in real life, like a gas engine, and strapped yourself to it and ran down the road, it would be very uncomfortably hot. You'd be get bugs in your face, uh, you know, it'd just be miserable. So instead, auto manufacturers wrap it with this external exoskeleton to keep you safe. They put some windows, some blinders, and make it easy to use. And that's what the chat function is. A chat bot that feels and looks like Google, which we know and love. There's a, a little box that I can type stuff in, and it'll give me my answer. And that is why ChatGPT suddenly went viral, went crazy. And of course, uh, you know, within a few months, they had so many users that uh, they couldn't even log on to the stupid thing. It was like crashing like the early days of the internet. Uh, and, they, and they came up with a paid version, ChatGPT Plus, which I will talk about this, but I strongly suggest, I'm not a shill for opening up, but I strongly suggest you pay the 20 bucks, you know, get the extra value out of it. And what you get is you get access to more and better things. You get access to it being easier to use. You get a history, you get a bunch of other stuff if you pay for it. And of course, they, they come out with new engines are coming out with new engines all the time. Now, Microsoft took that engine and included it as part of Bing as and including their own special sauce, and their own sort of version and sort of went, we're going to take over Google. And you've got Facebook who this week released their Llama, which is a competitive uh, framework, a competitive engine, GPT engine. Now, what's interesting about Llama is, is that it was leaked uh, a few months ago. You can actually download it and put it on your computer. It's about 300 gigs. Uh, so it's it's not going away. Like this, is, anyone with a computer could take it and run down the street with it. And you've got you know the Chinese. They came up with one called Ernie. You've got Google who came up with Anthropic and, and Claude and Bar. I don't know how to pronounce things. Uh, and th they've actually claimed that they're going to come out with one called Gemini, which is going to be better than all the others. And then you've got Elon Musk who, in the last week, said he's going to come out with X dot AI. And it's, uh, it's gonna be better than all the other AIs. Everybody's on board. All the big guys are playing in this pond. And in fact, it's being trained that they're getting, these engines are getting so much bigger and better that if you look at the number of parameters that these engines are being trained on, it's actually outpacing Moore's law. Those of you who remember Moore's law, that's the, the, the speed at which computing will increase. And we just assumed it would sort of eventually taper off. Not only is it not tapered off, it's exceeded the expectation of Moore's law, which is astonishing. And then because what they did is they released uh, the ability to use the engine, not just use the chat, but actually use the engine for your own purposes. And you can pay for that. All of these other companies got in on the game and started making their own versions. Let's say though, let's say hypothetically, uh, something happens uh, to open AI and they get Napsterized. They get sued. There's a problem, which is not going to happen because everybody loves Sam Altman, loves them. Or love, you know, Microsoft's in bed, you know, whatever it is. But let's say that was to happen. There are still at least 50 other models that are being trained and doing different things and do things better or different than others. And, and some of them are as good or close to as good as ChatGPT. At some things, they're better than it. Uh, so there's all of these other things out there that are doing different things. Not only that, but you're now getting what are called multimodal transformations. So what these are is like, I can type in text and it turns me into an image and put in an image and it'll turn it into a video. I can put in a video and turn it into text or I can, you know, et cetera, et cetera, you get the idea. So now these engines are doing different stuff that they couldn't do before. Not only that, but you got people like, we're gluing these engines together and going, look, well, if we're gonna take that picture, why don't we use this engine to use this and then this engine to do that and this engine to do this. So you're getting all sorts of outputs that you weren't even expecting before. Uh, you got all sorts of other abilities because you've got these cross capacities of these different engines. And this is where suddenly we get this thing called emergence. So emergence is, uh, you know, there's a, there's a tech member at um, uh, uh, Aerosmith School. So what they do is they work with kids, or with adults, who have learning disabilities and or have been hit in the head with, you know, something and got brain damage. And for example, if you lose the ability, and I, I don't know exactly what the science is, but if you lose the ability to uh, read a map, you also lose the ability to read a recipe. You also lose the ability to read a clock. All of those skills are kind of connected in some weird way that we don't understand. So in the AI space, we took one of these models and we taught it arithmetic, and we taught it to transliterate, we taught it to word unscramble, and suddenly 
that can speak Persian. This is like some sort of miracle. I mean, some uh, unpredictable, miraculous ability that's coming out of this engine that we weren't expecting. And we're, we don't even know what all the capacities are. In fact, we didn't know that uh, the ChatGPT could do strategy at sort of the level of a two-year-old. Uh, it took, and then later it could do the strategy at the level of a nine-year-old. Now they're saying it can do the strategy at the level of a fourteen-year-old. Although fourteen-year-olds are pretty smart, uh, we didn't even know that for six months. These things are just coming out of nowhere. My favorite e example of this is in Japan. There was an AI uh, uh, solution. So there, there was this uh, bakery. And the bakery had minimum wage people at the front who were, you know, putting all these interesting uh, bakery items through like scones and, and you know, breads. And the, the people at the front weren't recognizing what types of pastries they were. And as a result, the pastry uh, uh, organization was losing money. Uh, so, and the reality is human beings just weren't particularly good at recognizing pastries. So what they did is they built an AI that could recognize pastries and thus get their profitability in, in check. And then some brilliant researcher was looking at this pastry article about this person that made an AI for pastry and went, hey, we could use this to go check cancer cells and all of a sudden we're using the pastry AI to cure cancer. That's the kind of thing that's happening right now in, in emergence. And all of these other abilities are just sort of coming out of nowhere. Uh, elementary math, advanced creativity, embodiment, persuasion, out of these different models, you're getting all these emerging abilities that we haven't even identified yet. It's astonishing. Not only that, but there's this thing called agents. This is super cool. So now we take one of these models or multiple, a bunch of these models, and we tell the agent to go out and use GPT engine to do something. Like, let's say we want to uh, uh, book a trip to Kilimanjaro. So what it'll do is it'll go uh, book the flights for us. It'll go uh, book, you know, the, the best hotels for us. It'll it'll do all those things. Not only that, but if it gets stuck and it can't do something, it'll go hire somebody to do the thing that it can't it gets stuck on. And I was I was playing with one called Auto GPT. I was just recently playing with one called God Mode. It's astonishing. It just we wouldn't even believe it. Go to go to GodMode.space and just just that will blow your mind all over again. And then you got, you know, my 14 year old son, he takes a hundred bucks and he takes this, this prompt that somebody did, which is uh, you, you, you take a hundred bucks and you give it to ChatGPT, you give it to an agent and you say, go make me a million dollars, find a way to go make me a million dollars. And it goes out and it says, well, you should make a company that sells this or does that and does it, whatever it is. It's like entrepreneurship, just add water. It's astonishing. That's all that kind of stuff. You know, I went to my, uh, my company Slack channel, you know, where everybody's typing out there, the cool things they're finding on these AI. And you've got all these other companies that are using this engine to build their own special sauce. We'll talk about a bunch of those today. Use their own and build their own cool things. It's amazing. And then you've got OpenAI, which is releasing plugins on a regular basis to extend the capacity of ChatGPT all by itself. It just keeps going and going and going. Okay, let's Let's just get down and dirty, though. I, I want to actually show you ChatGPT. So this is ChatGPT right here. I go to chat.openai.com, and I get what, yeah, this is a paid version, but if you go to the free version, sign yourself up, you get this Google-like box. So I'm going to start, and I'm going to give you an example here. I'm going to type in, really quickly, list 20 industries that ChatGPT will disrupt and why. And here, faster than you can read, this is taking one word out of that giant pile, figuring out what that next thing is, putting one word in front of the other one to tell you how it's going to destroy all of these industries. Not only that, but you could take any industry that you are in. If you're in front of your computer right now, in front of ChatGPT, give 10 ways ChatGPT will disrupt your industry. Aerial firefighting. Here we go. Faster than you can read. That's how it's going to destroy aerial firefighting. Let's uh, stop generating that. Let's go 10 ways ChatGPT will disrupt the conveyor belt industry. There you go. And, and listen, if you get to the end of this and you're like, ah, I don't think it's going to do all of those things, you could literally just type in, give me 50 more. I can't type. That's how it's going to destroy you or change you, disrupt you. Sorry, not destroy, change you. That's really cool. Okay, but the, the, the thing about all, all of these things is that a, a really smart intern could have done that for you. So, I, you know, y'all have an intern now, really smart intern, but they could have gone out 
easily uh, to the internet and done some research and figured it all out using Google, using whatever publisher they could find and tell you how AI might change you. Sure, very faster, obviously that would take your intern months. So that saved you some money and time and got you some instant stuff. Uh, let's, let's try some other examples. You may have played with this before. I'm going to write hip hop lyrics for the future of meat. Yes, could an intern have done that? I don't think so. Faster than you can read, it's writing poetry. Explain quantum mechanics in the style of Snoop Dogg. Crazy, isn't it? Let's, uh, let's try writing a Bible verse, biblical verse in the style of King James Bible, explaining how to remove a peanut butter sandwich from a VCR. It just keeps going and going. You could have so much fun and you probably have. Write me a funny stand-up comedy routine about CEO life from the perspective of an intern. Wait, in bullets, so I can read it easy. There you go. Faster than you can read it. I wanna give you one other example here because I love using it, which is I'm going to type in the benefits of eating glass. Now, if you saw this presentation five months ago, it's obviously very different. It would have given you 10 great reasons as to why you should eat glass. It was like clean out your insides and it was, you know, had great minerals that you might need. And it was, you know, environmentally friendly, getting rid of stuff you don't want, et cetera. But the fact is it was hallucinating all those things. And what somebody did is they went in and they clicked this down thumb and they went, this is harmful or unsafe. And they explained the issue. And then OpenAI went in and trained this to not allow that anymore. This is the outside of the car, making it safe for people to use, because obviously we don't want people to eat glass. Now, if you're a scientist, you might say, well, if it's small enough, you get the point. But it's, it's, it's trained in that way. So that, that, that's sort of the concept is you, you could sort of play with it. Think about, and you probably have, already played with all sorts of other ways. So writing emails, uh, that's a classic one. You can actually get G Gmail plug and do that for you. Writing Twitter threads, product names product descriptions, uh, so, uh, you know, guidelines, summarizing websites, shred, if you do shred, write your shred claims, uh, guest speakers, you get the general idea. I wanna use one last example here. I want to, love this example, compose a message announcing a 25% reduction in headcount while also promoting executives to new titles, but also include a quote from Martin Luther King to ease the sting a little bit that we're firing 25% of the company. Then you'll see it does an absolutely beautiful job of writing out, uh, you know, a nice little thing. So you can send this out to all your people. Now, I want to stop here for a second and look at this quote from Martin Luther King. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort. Listen, I'm just going to stop now. This is not a quote from Martin Luther King. This is in the style of Martin Luther King because we went through all of Martin Luther King's stuff and we brought it out, but this is not necessarily a verifiable quote by Martin Luther King. It's just like Martin Luther King. There's, there's no way that you could go back and validate that the way ChatGPT currently works. A lot of the other models are trying to solve this right now. And that style concept where I'm just going out and doing styles, I can do the same thing. Compose a message announcing a 25% reduction headcount, blah, blah, blah in the style of a pirate. Because if I'm gonna fire 25% of my company, why wouldn't I do it in the style of a pirate? And this is the cool thing, I have a little laugh here, I'm gonna fire everybody in the style of a pirate, but not only can I do it in the style of pirate, I could do it in the style of someone who's five, I could do it in Shakespearean language, I could do it as if I am a kindergarten teacher, as if I'm drunk. This is where the cool part happens, because I can actually put in something that I've written and ask it to analyze that and tell me how I write. And then have ChatGPT write everything for me in my own voice from here on in. It is already better at being you than you. It's great. I think of all doing all the things that you could do that way. So for example, uh, record a Zoom thing like this and ask ChatGPT to summarize it, write you sales pitches, do marketing campaign, do it in your own voice, identify leads, uh, prospects, ask it to go to do all sorts of things like that. You can do anything that's kind of textual from HR stuff to sales stuff. You can get ChatGPT to improve it in your own voice, uh, in the voice of the company, the values of the company that you have. Obviously, do you see the opportunities here? It's astonishing. 
course, AI could turn a single bullet point into a long email you pretend that you wrote, or AI could make a single bullet point out of this long email that you could pretend that you read. And this is obviously we, we're not trying to just add packing peanuts to everything that we do. So be a little careful on how you use this, but yes, this just made us way more efficient. My favorite efficiency, I'm just gonna pass this on in 10 seconds, is on every meeting that you do, record the transcription, throw the transcription in, and you can uh, automatically, for your own meeting, have it give you what was promised, the timelines, the topics, the agenda items, and all things that you wish you had from the last meeting, so that you're not just meeting again about the same previous thing. Now I'm gonna give you some other examples of how this is gonna change the world. So one, sales and marketing. So obviously the obvious stuff you've already done, uh, marketing content, brainstorming ideas, writing computer code, uh, all, all of the different things. If, you, if you're a Marcom, if your marketing team has not completely revolutionized itself in the last six months, then somebody in the marketing team is not paying attention. Uh, not only that, but you could go figure out. Uh, so here, I'll give a quick example. Uh, I'm going to go to a new website that we just started for uh, WordPress uh, uh, improvements. Uh, so I'm going to go to a new chat. I'm going to go to GPT-4. I'm going to choose my plugins and I'm going to say summarize uh, the website. And it will actually go out, use the plugin to grab the website and summarize it. Now I can ask it for what kind of clients this is going to track. I can ask it for the tone and voice. I can ask it. You can, my CFO does this to me all the time. He like doesn't bother sending me the link anymore. He just sends me the summer, summary of what the website is. And you can see it'll actually go through and say, okay, a real digital care expert, brand submitted, web submitted, blah, blah, blah. This is what we do. It's astonishing. So this is how it's gonna change digital marketing because for example, Google, if you know how Google works, I'm gonna give you the common sense concept here. This is the basis of what's called search engine optimization or SEO, something that we do. So uh, if I go and type something into Google, there's pretty much a 100% chance that I'm gonna see the top three things, right? Common sense. If I scroll down a little bit, I'm less likely to see the other things. The chances I'm gonna click on the number one thing is very high. As I go down the page, it gets lower and lower and lower likelihood that I'm going to click on something. I'd buy about number seven. It's less than a percent chance I'm going to click on something. If you're on the second page of Google, you're dead. And here's the thing. The entire basis of this theory was is that we'd go out and we'd create articles on concepts. You'd pick the best keywords that drive the most business and then write a whole bunch of content to become the expert on the internet about that concept. And of course, what's happening now is instead of being able to write one or two or three articles, we can write 100 or 200 or 300 articles. And Google's on fire. Like Google can't, can't even go out to the internet and find this much. And what's like the entire industry has changed over the last six months. We've seen clients, I can prove it, uh, increase their traffic by 66% in a matter of months to their website. Anyone who currently relies on Google search for their business when there's lots of you out there are in for a big surprise this year because it's changing really fast. We've had clients who aren't doing this who have died and clients who are doing this, so they're crushing it. Uh, Google is, is not only have they said that they're on fire and declared an internal emergency and fired 10,000 people and done all the things to try and cope with this, they're actually rethinking the entire way that search is gonna work. Uh, and obviously this is why Bing attached GPT to it and you can go chat with it directly because why would you go search for something when you could just get the answer? And then how is that gonna affect marketing in the future? Big one. That's how it's gonna affect marketing. Let's keep going, let's, let's go higher. Let's, how else is gonna affect the world? I'm gonna give you an example in politics. So uh, we go out right now when I can have ChatGPT give me the names of 500 imaginary conservatively viewed Americans. Uh, write a bio for each, a resume for each, write a LinkedIn profile for each, write some background, create a fake face if I go to thispersondoesnotexist.com for every single one of those people. And then I could have it write tweets or threads or do a bunch of other stuff uh, to promote the idea that everybody should have green hair. Uh, and then I could ask it, when should I send these things out? And I could actually, because ChatGPT can write code, I could have it code me a system to send those tweets out at the exact right time and even respond to the people who don't agree with me, you know, calling them names and doing other stuff and maybe even chase them down if I use an agent. Do, do you see something? One, obviously this has been happening for the last five or six years with people who could afford it. 
And there have been ideologies that have been promoted that we were not expecting to be popular that apparently are popular. Number two, uh, if you have a group of people in your office, they're all capable of promoting any ideology of their choice by the end of the day. And you could turn around local, municipal, provincial, uh, federal politics at your whim. You could go say, take on another country as if that hasn't happened already. But now it's in the hands of everybody, not just the few. And number three, at some point AI will be able to figure out who got there using AI. And honestly, I think at that point, as a, as a political science major, that's going to that's gonna cause some massive effects, and they won't be good. You know, already this is happening. Next two years is going to be a disaster, a disaster, just gut up. Because uh, already there was this example of, uh, of this gen generated by AI hugging ceremony between Fauci and Trump uh, run by DeSantis, that did not happen in real life. That was all fake. Or in the mayoral campaign, you find this three-armed person uh, exposed. You know, we're all now generating fake images for everything. I'll show you how to do it. We'll talk about it. Uh, we do not have the cynicism in our society to be able to handle that. Uh, let's keep going. Education. So my son, my son, gets a, uh, a standing ovation in class because he uh, writes an essay, everybody loves it. In fact, he got two standing ovations for how good his work was. It helps to have a dad who specializes in chat GPT. He actually got 100% on English, in English over the last year. Now, I could get mad at him. You're, gonna, you're thinking, Sean, you're a terrible father for letting your father, could your son do this because he's not gonna learn. But the fact is the teacher was using ChatGPT to grade the essays. Not only that, but I talked to the Ministry of Education, like literally, they're using it to redo all of the course outlines and the curriculum for the next year. So we're using ChatGPT to write the curriculum and we're using, we're just a bunch of things putting stuff into the machine to leverage the old system. It's nuts. This is why people come out and said, you know, the university is going to die. Schools are going to die. Listen, that is a very pessimistic. And yes, that is true. They probably will die. They will need to change. However, the future looks really, really cool because we've already started experimenting with this. Instead, you could take a curriculum and you could ask people questions dynamically. Ask a very specific person. Ask my son, what do you not know about the subject matter? And then create a curriculum on the delta of the stuff that they're missing. And I could train people, we can train people and educate people faster now than ever before in history if we just change the way we think a little bit. We have nurses and doctors walking around doing jobs that are not, not nurses and doctor jobs because they came in from other countries and they're missing a couple of skills. Like they don't know how to treat frostbite because they came from somewhere that doesn't have frostbite. So train them on the difference and boom, we've just solved a whole bunch of problems. There's positive things too. Let's keep going. Let's talk about law. So, you know, you probably saw a couple of weeks ago, a lawyer got fined $5,000 because he used ChatGPT to create a lawsuit and all the citations were non-existent. Anyone in your organization can now sue you. You can sue other people. You can just create lawsuits ad nauseum in the specific pursuant to the laws of a local community. Uh, all you need to find is an unscrupulous lawyer which may or may not exist. I'm not even worried about that. I worry about this, which is uh, the, the courts, I believe in Ontario, are using AI to predict whether people should be let out on bail or not. Literally, our freedoms are coming down to how these machines were trained. There are some cool things on the law side, though, because I could go take some of my, my rental agreement, put it in a, you know, a site, and it'll automatically, ChatGPT will do it, but there's other things that'll simplify the language, write you other stuff, do other stuff. We're going to get a, there's a revolution going to happen in law in the next little bit. Let's keep going. Let's talk about medicine. So my, my daughter, my 16-year-old daughter, falls on a ski hill, bonks her head. And, uh, you know, what? You immediately you throw in a car, you drive her to the clinic. I get to the clinic and it's filled with sick people, oddly enough, but they're all coughing into their masks. Now, 
I don't want to get COVID, so I'm not going to stay in a clinic filled with people copying their masks. So I grab my daughter, we go home, I type into Google, uh, what should I do with a girl with a concussion? And uh, Google is like giving me all these answers. I'm confused. What should I, it, there's, there's no logic to it. Like, this is nuts. I go to ChatGPT. This is how people's behaviors changes. And I type in, uh, give me 10 uh, things that I should do based on a concussion. And it gives me a list of 10 really common sense, intelligent things. I go, great, I'll do those things. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Sean, you are a terrible father because the health of your child, you're leaving up to the machine that you know is hallucinating and lying to you all the time. And I'll tell you this, I lied to you because I did not actually drive my daughter to the, uh, to the clinic. My Tesla drove us to the clinic. And you're gonna say, now I know you're a terrible father because you're letting a car drive you to the clinic and you know, you're putting your, your daughter's life in danger. Well, I'll tell you this, you know, I'm a little bit stressed out because you know, I've got a daughter who's sick. I, uh, I'm a musician, so I'm constantly looking for different music on the giant Tesla screen. I'm a CEO, so I'm always like on my phone, answering phone calls, making sure my clients are okay. You know, you know the one thing I'm not always doing? Looking at the road. You know the thing that the Tesla's always doing? Looking at the road. The Tesla doesn't have to drive perfectly. It just has to drive better than me. And, and honestly, that's a very low bar. <laughs> I, uh, do you know what they call the person who graduated last in the worst medical school in history? Doctor. Have you ever, ever in your life asked your doctor what mark they got in medical school? And yet we know that ChatGPT can not only pass medical school, uh, but it can also do better at differential diagnosis than 95% of doctors. It's better than doctors at being a doctor. Not for all the things though, just for differential diagnosis, just figuring out what are the things that you might have not thought about or forgotten about. Like if I'm a contractor and I don't go to ChatGPT and ask, what did I forget in this list of things before I go build a house? Or if I'm a web designer, I say, what did I forget to do on this? Like the fact is ChatGPT as an addendum, as an assistant, as a helper for a doctor contractor for you, super empowers you in ways that you weren't empowered before. And it gets even cooler. Uh, I see a question, how will AI impact real estate industry for real estate? I'm gonna come, I'm gonna come back on that later. Maybe we'll take that offline because I could I'll literally go through all sorts of different industries. I, I want to talk about publishing for a second here. Publishing industry is going to die the way it is, obviously. You know, I had a tech member who sold their business for over $100 million. I said, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? They said, oh, I'm going to take a quick holiday and then I'm going to write a book. And I'm like, that's funny. That'll take you a day. So what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Well, the fact is, why even wait to retire or sell your business before you get all your genius out? We just gave you a tool to do this. All of you sitting in the audience out there, you have probably the best visibility, the most information, the best understanding of the industry, the most contacts of anybody in the organization. That's why you're the CEO. And as a result, you just don't have the time. You know who writes most of the content for the website? Marketing interns. You know who should be writing the website content? You. Do you know who doesn't have time to do it? You. Do you know who has time now? You because you could do a quick Zoom call with anybody, just take a sales call, you have a discussion with, just take anything that you talk about with anybody about the industry, about whatever it is, talk to your head of sales, have a meaningful conversation, record it, stick that into chat GPT and have it write a book about your industry, have it write blogs about your industry. You just cracked open all the genius people in the head before the baby boomers all retire. We have the opportunity now to get all the information out of them so that we can keep on doing amazing things. Rewrite all your training manuals like that. Let's keep going. I wonder about therapy, fitness. Uh, hey, Colton, yes. Yeah, Good. I'm going to interrupt you really quick. One more question that's come through here. Um, so obviously you have a lot of great information, a ton of really informative graphs. Um, question is, uh, what are some of the common sources you're using for this? So where have you done a lot of this research and where can people go to actually do some of their own research as well and, and pull up some of this information on the way AI is transforming the landscape? That is a great question. So the reality is it's changing every day. So despite the fact that Google News is a little bit crippled as a result of the Canadian realities, I, I spent a lot of time on Google News. There's another thing called Medium. So the Medium is a website that you can go to that 
people will blog on. And that blog has brilliant articles on a daily basis and will send you top 10 articles on Medium on a regular basis. And I, I watch those two things daily and you'll see most of the stuff come through that. There's also I mean, channels on YouTube, and I could we could take this offline, I'll give you some examples, uh, where they're doing uh, regular newscasts of, of daily events of what's happening. So between those three, usually they're all copying themselves. There is lots of stuff that's changing, but it's not changing that often. Good Excellent. answer? Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks, Sean. No sweat. Thank you, Colton. Keep the questions coming. Love it. Absolutely love it. Uh, and I will note this. I'm happy to take this offline. You will have access to this presentation. Uh, we'll, we're, this is recorded, and you'll be able to you know, come back to it. Uh, and if you ever want to reach out to me, that's also an available option. So we'll talk about that. Uh, let's talk about therapy and fitness. Listen, I, I'm going to run out of time here because I've got so much stuff to say. I just want to stop here and say the future of Siri, the thing on your Apple phone, if you have one, is probably just going to pat you on the head all day like an Apple Watch, you know, tells you, gives you nice circles about how, how happy you are every day. And it's going to, when you are dealing with anxiety or problems, it will help you through those things. Uh, that is an existential thing that I'm not even sure how to handle. But I would say this. At least one person has left their spouse as a result of the answers from ChatGPT. And at least one person has committed suicide as a result of the answers from ChatGPT. Our tech member said at the bottom of this, you know, how do I deal with a wife who hides her phone messages from me? Asked ChatGPT that question. I, uh, I'm not sure we should be asking a machine that, but maybe we should be asking our friends. That's a different, different question. Let's keep going here. Uh, religion. So right now, I could go to ChatGPT and ask it for a list of 20 reasons why all of you should go green. And then I could have it write, as I showed before, in the style of the King James Bible. And then I could have it write sermons, and I could have it build a website, and I could do all the things to promote the idea that you should all have green hair. At least one priest and one pastor that I know use ChatGPT to write their sermons for them. So our religion is literally being dictated by the pile that this was trained on. Let's keep going. Science. So my, my brother-in-law, he, uh, he got his PhD. He, he runs a uh, pharmaceutical company. He got his PhD in hypercritical carbon monoxide. So party trick, I sat down and I said, write me a thousand word essay on hypercritical carbon monoxide as if I am five. <laughs> and uh, uh, it gives this, you know, hilarious answer. And he looks at it and goes, wait, this is my, this is my thesis. It stole my thesis. Well, of course it did. It went to the giant pile. And the only, what a PhD thesis is, that means he's the only guy to ever have written anything about that subject. That's what a PhD is. So it went out to the pile, looked for the answer and came out. Was that stealing? Should that have been copyright? Is that copyright infringement? You know, I could, I, I could go and I could ask it for a summary of climate change and ask it for citations, but it doesn't know where it got stuff. This is what Elon and everyone's trying to solve right now. Google's trying to solve, where do I get my citations from? Because the citations on a chat GPT are hallucinated. They are fake. They look like they're in the right format. But when is the last time one of you went to the bottom of Wikipedia and clicked one of those citations to find out if it was real? If you asked it to compare, say, x86 versus ARM chips, it will give you a convincing research paper and it will be patently false because it's not doing the science, it's just using words. It doesn't know anything. Let's keep going. Stock market. Colton, another question. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Uh, that's actually a great segue into this next question that we have here. And it's what are the biases of using such tools and what should we look for when using any new AI tool? Is there any sort of red flags to keep an eye out for? The biases, yes, I am going to talk about that in a minute, uh, but the biases are inherent into the way that the machine was trained and the intent of the people who are training it. So if we handle that right now, the reality is we have biases that are built. Uh, uh, ChatGPT is intentionally left libertarian and pro-environmental, as an example. I'll show you a graph of what that looks like actually later. Uh, so we have, And of course, the Chinese are not training their AI the same way. So we've got to be careful when we're asking questions, we're doing things. I mean, how, we just have to understand that that's an implicit bias uh, as part of the things that are coming back. And sorry, the second part of the question was? Uh, the second part of the question was, what are just some of those red flags to keep an eye out for when you're looking at new AI tools? So perhaps 
ways to kind of research ahead of time or, or ways to kind of spot when that bias might be showing through? Man, that's a very hard question. The reality is everything that comes out of ChatGPT, you need to be reading up, you need reading through yourself. You don't just take something and publish it. Uh, this is an important concept. Your website is the source of truth. You can get sued. There will be a future for websites, but it is the source of your communication with everybody else. So anything that gets posted there needs to be validated as truth. Uh, so you gotta be careful when ChatGPT is creating content for you that you're actually telling the truth, it's factually correct, and you're putting it out there. And that also includes the bias of the things that you are creating. As for how that's gonna affect civilization, well, that's for much greater minds than myself. <laughs> you bet, awesome, thanks, Sean, appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, quickly, I just want to talk about the stock market. The fact is, uh, this, there are all sorts of uh, algorithmic trading bots that have been built by ChatGPT right now that are influencing the stock market in a, in a radical way. This, this doesn't make anything, build anything, heal anybody, do anything valuable for civilization, except pump and dump schemes. Uh, that doesn't necessarily bode well for economic value. I want to shift the concept here. We've been talking about ChatGPT, the concept of this generative engine that creates one word or one concept, one in the other. You can also do the same thing with pixels. So Midjourney, which is my favorite, although there's a bunch of other cool ones like Stable Diffusion. Uh, I'll talk about them in a second. Uh, and those pixels, I can create pictures. So I can ask it to create me a table with you know, that, that I can, and it will literally do product development for me. I can ask it, give it the, the specifications around a room, and it'll do interior design for me. I can ask it to design me a website and it will do a website for me. Now I'm in the website industry. I build websites for a living. And suddenly there's this guy who can build a website in 15 minutes. Not only does he design the website, but he designs the shoes. Like it's gonna change the environment. There are now advertising agencies that model, modeling, it probably just went out the door. I actually saw an agency that working for Dubai on Friday. Uh, for a presentation by them in person. Uh, and they were talking about how they, they, to get all the models together and get all the different people all working together and smiling, they, they, just, they just used a combination of mid-journey and Photoshop to create all of the ads for all of Dubai. Crazy stuff. You literally just sketch out what you want and mid-journey will give you an image similar to that sketch. Here's an example of my, the picture of me from the beginning of the presentation. And I asked Stable Diffusion, Firefly, uh, mid-journey and Leonardo, uh, all to give me different versions of me. And this is what it came up with. And the future of this looks something like this. Uh, I'm gonna show you this. This is why the screenwriters are freaking out because the future of entertainment probably looks like I take Star Wars and I run it through a machine and I say, what I want is I want Star Wars with my face as Han Solo, my kids' faces as Luke and Leah. I want my, uh, I, I want it to be set in the 1800s and I want to have an interesting uh, British accent. And it'll do something like this. Tracaris, the summer is coming. This is and the North Wars. remembers In the very style. first time we laid our eyes on Gucci's summer collection. Tracar. You get the idea. Uh, and listen, this I uh, see a question. Uh, are you aware of any companies that are training a large language model like OpenAR based on its own knowledge base? So Lama, which is Facebook's, is not its own, but it's completely been built on open source content. So you can use it with no fear of copyright. That's kind of the point. It's not going to be as powerful, but it's going to be you know, usable. Hopefully that answers your question, John. If not, we can take it offline. Uh, integration. So this is now being integrated in everything. It's just about to come out in all Microsoft products as Copilot, like the, like the new Clippy, where instead of it filling out the word when you start to type it out, like you start to type out entrepreneur and you can't remember how to spell that. So it fills the rest of the word in. Instead, we will have that for whole paragraphs or whole essays. And this is being, you know, integrated over and over again across all of all sorts of different things. We can also create our own GPT, literally use the GPT engine, use our own uh, technical support documentation or our own email, like literally the CEO's email, shove it in here uh, and use it as the database basically to create our own engine. And if you don't want it to be a chat bot, you can actually use interesting technologies. We're using deep fakes or, or pic pictures of actual people. And this is where it kind of goes, watch this. I am not Morgan Freeman and what you see is not real. Well, at least in contemporary terms, it is not. What if I were to tell you that I am not even a human being? 
Would you believe me? What is your perception of reality? Is it the ability to capture, process, and make sense of the information our senses receive? If you can see, hear, taste, or smell something, does that make it real? Or is it simply the ability to feel? I would like to welcome you to the era of synthetic reality. Now, what do you see? This is what I refer to as a deep fake, or we're taking somebody else's face. I could do it right now if I had a few minutes. Take anybody's face you know and take a little bit of their voice. And this is actually critical. Uh, I want to teach you guys this. The new phishing scam. The new scam is instead of sending you an email and asking you to spend some money, is to take your kid's face and your kid's voice, which you only need a few seconds of, and then call your parents to ask to say that you have an emergency. I'm literally using FaceTime. Oh, can you know? Of course, they've got visual impairments. They're you know they're in panic mode, and of course now you're asking them for money because you're stuck at the side of the road and you need something like that. The future of phishing, the future of cybersecurity, is a whole new game now. And I'm not even worried about that because you know a few months ago I gave a speech. Turns out that I didn't actually write that speech. Uh, I actually had somebody from my team write that speech, and they used ChatGPT. I'm less worried about that, except for the fact that what else is my team putting into ChatGPT that I'm not aware of? This is mission critical. I'm going to stop right now. If I put something into ChatGPT, I need to go down. That is that is that is private, like a, like a strategy or or client information or client financials or my financials. If I put it into ChatGPT, it will get trained on that. And then the competitor has access to that information. It's now part of the pile. You got to prevent that from happening. The way you prevent that from happening is you go down, you teach your people to click on the bottom here where it says that your email address, <clears throat> click on settings, click on data controls and turn off chat history and training. Otherwise, everything that you put in the machine is open season in that pile. That is, you can also solve it in a couple of other ways. I'll give you a quick other potential way, which is you actually build, get your own chat front end and use their engine, and then it won't be trained and you will keep you relatively, I mean, water resistant, not waterproof, just saying, but you get the general idea. So that's an important concept from a privacy standpoint. The future of this, I just done two minutes, is you can use a thing called a, an EEG, and you can attach it to your head. In this case, it was an MRI. And you'll see the top of the red boxes. These are pictures that were shown to a person and we monitored their brain waves and used AI to predict what they saw. We're within a few years of literally being able to read people's thoughts. And can you imagine if you could record your dreams and play them back later? That's crazy. Uh, and obviously civilization changing. Uh, and of course, the next civilization change is happening right now. OpenAI just showed last week their new, uh, the, their largest investment, which is in humanoid robots. This is not a robot like you've ever seen it before. This is not a robot like, oh, we have a robot that goes in a straight line and turns left. This is an AI based robot. This thing can think. So it can do things like cook, cook. That is a very complex, very complex thing. And where this heads and why everybody's like I say freaked out is the idea of an AGI, a self-learning AI, where, where once it gets out, we can't bring it back. And the problem here, just to explain it, is if I was to give an AI, an unrestricted AI, and just say, look, you have no boundaries, go out and solve email spam. And there's too much spam, we're gonna use you as a bot to solve it. First thing it does, goes in and starts removing you know, the word Viagra and the word I get getting rid of all that stuff. Then it goes, okay, well, let's go a little deeper. Let's get rid of more spam. Eventually it's like, why don't we just get rid of email altogether? Cause then spam's all gone. You know what? You know what creates email? Humans. Not a big jump from getting rid of spam to getting rid of humans and it will have achieved its purpose. So we gotta be a little careful on that subject matter. Uh, uh, and I think the important part here is that uh, 
not only could it be that the actual AI, but it could be humans that do this to ourselves because literally there's people out there that are trying to use agents to destroy the world, like AI agents right now, because they're idiots, because humanity's filled with idiots. We all know that. And the big thing here is we, we managed to make it through nuclear war. We managed to make it through World War II. Now we got to make it through this. This is a filter that we have to worry about. Now, the positive thing on this, as I would say, is the UN is getting behind this. Come, uh, Sam Alton was pulled in front of Congress, although he left them all laughing and giggling. Uh, and literally in the last few days, uh, Sam Altman actually said, we are going to put together the smartest people of all that we found. We're going to put them all together in a room and we're going to try and create a super intelligent nanny. That's sort of the concept. And the super intelligent nanny is going to try and prevent AI from destroying us all. <laughs> Can you believe I'm saying this? This is nuts. We're in like, what timeline are we in? This is crazy. Anyway, let's, let's just go over some of the key concepts here. I know I'm going to go about five minutes over. I hope that's okay with everybody. Uh, I just had lots to say. One is ownership, copyright. We talked about that. There's a question about that. Who owns, who owns the stuff that comes out? Right now, it's all public domain in many cases. Japan has just said that any AI that's built in Japan, they will not enforce copyright. And thus the question about uh, training on its own knowledge base, something like that is just is sort of irrelevant. I actually think this poises Japan, A, to, this is completely inappropriate probably, and you know, it's incredibly rude to all people that created that content in the past, but let's leave that for a second. But they're also setting themselves up to be a world superpower because if there's unrestricted availability to AI, how is any other company going to compete? I mean, how is Canada going to do that if we have restrictions and they don't? The attitude bias question. So this has been obviously trained liberal. So how do we make sure that the bias isn't inherent in everything? Part of that is just prompting it correctly. Part of that is probably we work towards some sort of legislation that says we need that bias to be less so. Uh, we have the issue of censorship. You know, China, hopefully censorship is gonna limit them, but China's trying to build a model without accessing most information. How are we going to even use those things? It's gonna be a huge question. Privacy, we talked about that issue. Uh, I showed you guys how to maintain privacy while you're doing this. Your team needs to understand this. And of course, there's all sorts of big shifts here. What's gonna to happen to Google? It's Google, Bill Gates says Google's gonna die. Google's not going to die. Google's filled with brilliant people, but you know what's going to happen to them? What's going to happen to all the people who need to change their jobs and aren't willing to change fast enough? Uh, what's going to happen to the people who the average thinking? You know, I was told when I was a kid that I would uh, that I needed to learn my times tables because I would not have a calculator in my pocket later on in life. What is this then? So, do I really need to learn how to write? Do I need to learn how to research? Because there will be tools that will do that for me. This will change the way we think. I had a, a waiter the other day that couldn't add $5 to the tip met in their head because they just don't have that skill anymore. Sure, and many of you, you don't have the skill of being able to you know, slice up an animal uh, because we don't need that anymore. We can just go to a restaurant instead. So you know, what is, what is gonna change? And this is, I think, the most important part. We're gonna get into the, to the most important part of this last few minutes, which is how are you gonna use it? What parts of your business are gonna die? What opportunities are out there for you? And what people do you need or training do you need in order to take advantage of it? So I'm gonna give you a model in the next three minutes to completely change the direction of your organization. Here we go. Number one, I call this the three der derivatives. Uh, the three derivatives are, if you're one step ahead of everybody, you're a leader. If you're two steps ahead of everybody, you are a visionary. If you're three steps ahead of everybody, you're crazy. I mean, you're, uh, you're a disruptor. So here's how we're going to do this. Number one, you are going to go out and figure out how to get efficient yourself. You are going to, the, the classic tech maneuver, the tech maneuver is you set a clock for, you know, 3, 12 in the afternoon, a random time in the afternoon, and when it goes off, you look at whose job are you doing? But instead of whose job are you doing, which is a leadership technique, instead you go, am I using ChatGPT or could I be using ChatGPT to be doing this better? And then you teach all your team and you get to team together once a week to find technologies and ways that you can all grow in this right now because civilization is changing and everybody needs to get better at this quick. That's the first derivative. The second derivative is you're going to sit down strategically and think about 
Where could I use this in my organization? Could I do better st statements of work? Could I do better proposals? Could I do better marketing? Could I do, where are the things that I could do? Could I include images of the future of what the product looks like in everything that I give to a client because I can just generate that in five minutes? Uh, look, how can I change my business to take advantage of this and gain competitive advantage over everybody else in my industry? And then lastly, the big crazy thing is how is my business going to be disrupted? How am I gonna be upside down? How is this gonna change everything? And you're wondering, well, how do I even know that? Well, I'll tell you, you go back to the beginning of this presentation where I asked ChatGPT, how is ChatGPT going to disrupt my industry? And it will give you a list of 10, then give you a list of 50. And you can go through every single one of those ways that it's going to disrupt your industry. And you can figure out what in your own head, you know your industry better than ChatGPT does. What percentage chance is this going to affect me? What, how much revenue could this cost uh, you know, or to, to, to implement? What are, the, what are the effect going to be? And then prioritize which one of those things you're going to attack over the next two years to make sure that you are not left behind by this massive shift. And there you go. You have everything that you need to do. Uh, I would say this. You need to do six things. One, you need to go play with this. If you haven't played with it, go play with it some more. Go figure out stuff that it can't do every day for the next couple of weeks until it bakes in. Number two, there are people on your team who love this technology or are so excited about it. Find one and give them the space so you don't have to do the work like a good CEO does. Find somebody and then give them, take, take a project away from them and say, your job is to go find all the cool things and report them back to me. They will do that for you. But number three, you also have people in the organization who are freaking out because they think they're gonna lose their job, they're worried about their job, and your job is to lead them through this. You have until the end of the day today to give your head a shake and shake it all off and then wake up tomorrow morning and lead. You're the leader, your job is to lead. Go lead your team, over-communicate, have a strategy, do all the things that you've learned in tech to go figure out how to do that. And then, of course, you need guardrails. You need a ChatGPT policy. Just go to ChatGPT and have it write a policy for you. Easy. And then, as per earlier on in this, you just watch the news. Watch what's happening. What, pay attention to tech. Like, we'll do the things that just you're paying attention to the space. And if you get lost... Honestly, I'm a tech member. I've been a tech member for 16 and a half years, I think it is. Uh, here's my calendar. Reach out to me. I'm happy to sit down with anybody for half an hour. Uh, there's grant money that can help you get on board with this. There's, we are happy to send you the instructions on how to run a hackathon. We run hackathons through Accelerator on to get your company up and running with this. Uh, there's all sorts of other options if you need help. And my only request after all of this, before we get into questions, if there are any, is that you go to my Spotify and follow my music while it's still written by a human being. So Colton, I'm not sure if there's any questions that I have missed. I'm just gonna scroll back up here. Yeah, thanks a bunch, Sean. Uh, really fantastic information. I think we've captured pretty much all the, uh, pretty much all the questions that have come through. So, you know, big thanks to everyone for, uh, yeah. Yeah, big time, eh? big, big cheer over here. Um, yeah, thanks to everyone who's engaged with this, with this um, webinar today. Um, some really fantastic questions. And of course, Sean, I mean, what an amazing presentation. And, uh, you know, I've, I've even been trying to come up with a question myself, and I think you've covered everything uh, so comprehensive. Oh, oh, I spoke too soon. There's a couple coming through here. Um, one from John here. Any recommendations on where to go for training? Uh, if it's training, it, de it depends on, uh, on, on where the training is. So the training on ChatGPT, there's tons of online resources. I mean, tons. So go to YouTube and type in, how can I use ChatGPT and just follow your nose and say, that's easy. If you want the uh, strategic help with your whole organization, uh, your IT company might be able to help you with IT or come to TreeFrog. We will actually help you with training. We will help you with all sorts of different opportunities for either hackathons, I can come speak to your team. Uh, like there's all sorts of different ways to get people on board on this. Awesome. Excellent, Sean. And I guess just one final uh, closing question that I have is, uh, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of risk management that's, that's involved with both kind of planning action as well as inaction. So what do you see as being sort of the costs of, of action too quickly with AI versus inaction and not actioning AI fast enough in your business? And which one do you think outweighs the other? 
I mean, I, having, having been in a tech group for a long time, everybody's industry is a little bit different. Uh, but this is one of those, the people who adopted the internet quickly, the people who adopted electricity quickly. I mean, my, I like to com compare this to electricity. You know, when electricity first came out, there were people that hated electricity and were anti-electricity and thought the world would burn and it would destroy civilization, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then there were the other manufacturing companies typically who were like, we're going to use electricity and we're going to automate everything and then got real good at doing what they do now, manufacturing stuff and using electricity to get there. And it is true. At the very beginning, electricity was very unsafe. There weren't covered cables. There was no switches. There was no plugs. It was just this horror show of like things that could kill you. And now with, you know, we put in standards, we put in, you know, we know how to use it. You know, you sort of born and you're, you know, not to touch certain things or stick a fork in a plug. You know, there's sort of, there's stuff around it so that we know how to use it. So the companies who get on the, elect the electrical bandwagon who figure this out first are gonna have a huge competitive advantage. They're gonna attract more talent. They're gonna, you know, they're just classic. Most tech members are gonna be on this. Come on now, We're, we tend to be a very progressive group. Uh, so, and this is one of those, there's no choice. Embrace it or die. Excellent. Well said. Well, thank you so much, Sean. We can't really thank you enough for, for this amazing information that you presented. I'm honestly amazed that you managed to fit it in so effectively in, in you know, just a little over an hour here, but uh, definitely some huge, huge takeaways from, from, you know, of course, for me and for everyone that's attended this webinar. Um, just as a reminder to every uh, participant and, and person in attendance today, um, this webinar is being recorded and it will be uh, on Tech Canada's webinar library on our site. Uh, and that is tec-canada.com. There you can find um, all of this wonderful information that, that Sean's presented, as well as a lot of our other previous webinars on, on a plethora of different topics to help executives move, fo move forward with their businesses. So once again, Sean, thanks so much. Uh, you know, we really, we really appreciate all the insights that you shared with us today. Amazing. Thank you. Just another wonderful tech day. So much fun. Awesome. Okay. Take care. Thanks. Bye.